We all deserve to have those same needs met. But in your mindset, you always want to have a hostile mindset, an underdog mindset. Why? Why would you want to be the favorite? The, fa the underdog has nothing to lose. No one expects you to win. They don't think you could do it. They don't think you can go get to another level in your salary. They don't think you can get the corner office. They don't think you can go to the better college. They don't think you can make be a starter on the team. And that's what's going on in your voice and your head. And you're combining it with your soul, which says, if not you, then who? If not me, why not? Why not me? Why can't I do this? And you're having this kind of battle with these two voices. But ultimately, the mindset always needs to be the underdog because you have nothing to lose. And that's the inspiration of what I call the game within the game. If you get on the court and you're playing this, you know, you can't play the score. you got to always play the game. And there can never be a shot clock in your game. Your goal is to do your best. G'day everyone, Craig from People With A Passion and thank you for joining me on today's episode. If you haven't yet subscribed, please take a moment to do so. It's your way of helping support me and what I do. If you're new to the channel, this is your first time here, please also hit the notification bell as well as the subscribe button to be notified when new interviews are actually uploaded. Today's guest is a memorabilia mogul. Some would argue he's the king of sporting memorabilia. Starting his business, Steiner Memorabilia, over 30 years ago, he's now left that business to disrupt the industry with his new business called Collectible Exchange. He also still runs his brand, Steiner Agency, where he connects elite athletes with charities and businesses. And he is really, really, really uh, enthusiastic in this interview and it's in it's contagious so I, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did in uh, conducting it so thanks for being here I hope you relax and enjoy whether you be watching and or listening to this episode of people with a passion with my guest Brandon Steiner today's episode is brought to you by applaudable.net to talk about a number of things with you in fact looking at your websites there's so many things that we could and angles and, and approaches we could take i think what's really important just to get the, the, the conversation started is it doesn't really matter where you are what matters is what you wanted to accept so if you have a high level of non-acceptance you're somebody who's really headed in the right direction if you're saying i'm good which a lot of us fall into that trap you know we can accomplish some of our goals uh, we do a little better even than we thought. Those are people that are a really dangerous place. You have to have a high level of non-acceptance. And only until you do. Um, because high levels of, of non-acceptance will lead you to dream big, lead you to commitment. And then when you're committed, you start thinking about all the things you could do to force the issue of you not accepting what you got. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you get passionate about it. So, you know, I was... You know, my mom was my biggest mentor, and her favorite line was, you got to have balls and um, be passionate, be fearless. Don't stop. Don't stop at success. The only people that make it and are remembered, those two together, are extraordinary people. And to be extraordinary, you got to blow past success. So don't get too caught up in yourself. Mm -hmm. And I went to go see her, and, and I said, you know, Mom, I want to, I'm, I'm thinking about changing careers. And she's like, you're 12. What? I said, well, I've been working already for three years. I want to have more time after school and on the weekends. So she sent me to get a paper route. And in Brooklyn, in New York City, the paper route in the 70s is very popular. That's where most people got the paper. And I would go around. And I, I opened up a route with 29 dailies and 34 Sundays. And there was a contest. Whoever opens up the most accounts can, wins a box of candy bars. Great. Knocking on doors in Brooklyn. A lot of apartment buildings. I think this is going to be a gold rush for me. I'm winning multiple boxes. After a week of knocking on doors, I got zero, nothing. And I am irate, pissed, bummed. And as I'm walking home, um, I go in this one building and I'm knocking on doors, nothing. I knock on this woman. She's well in her 70s. I said, man, would you have to get the paper delivered? I see you have a stack of the Daily News in your house. I mean, she says, no, I get it from the corner store. I'm good. I said, yeah, but it's the same price for me as the corner store. He says, yeah, but then I got to tip you. So I go home. I tell my mother, we got to move out of this neighborhood. You know, the excuses. The people are cheap. Uh, this is a bad neighborhood. There are a lot of lousy, you know, really rotten people that live here. And uh, my mother says, sit down and sit down now. You have to realize that you got to stop selling and start serving, solving. People want, if you're going to sell the same thing that other people sell, you got to differentiate yourself. 
And you got to actually give them something that's going to be unique that can help them. And I was trying to wrap my arms around that, so I'm knocking on more doors, and literally another three days go by, nothing. It's 10 at night. I go back and knock on the older woman's door, figure maybe I could change her mind. She thinks there's a fire in the building. She's like, what do you want? It's 10 o'clock at night. I said, man, just give me a minute. If there's torrential downpour, blizzard, heat wave, snowstorm, it's poor rain and poor rain. If I bring you milk and bagels on Wednesday and Sunday, hot bagels on Sunday morning, and if you need something else, I'll bring it to you. You would do that for me? And so I was concerned. A woman of your age, when there's really adverse conditions out there, you shouldn't be out with that kind of situation. And I'll help you get your death necessary needs. That's so sweet. Now, she did sign up for the paper. What I didn't realize is that she was going to be the mother load. And I went from 29 dailies to 199 dailies and 234 Sundays. She turned me on to everyone in the neighborhood. I was delivering more milk and bagels, you can't imagine, in a shopping cart. Forget the bicycle. But I want the people listening and really how this story really relates to them is, is, is that are you really listening to your customers and selling them what they need and really listening to them the way they need the item you're, you have and how it needs to be presented and sold to them? Are you solving a problem? Because solution selling is the road to success. Like you need to be a solution-based salesperson, even when you're solving a problem for somebody that doesn't help you on the bottom line. If you're not looking at your customer worrying about his problems or her problems and figuring out how to solve them, whether they're doing a charity fundraiser, whether they're trying to get their kid in, in, into a private school, or whether their kid has a special need or something that one needs to do for their spouse, whatever you can do to serve somebody, that's how you build a relationship with someone by adding value. Now, value is something that's just not talked about anymore. You know, so if you're sitting with a, a product and a company and you're not thinking about what value you really provide, then I have to question what you're doing. And value is what you could do for someone that they can't do for themselves. And if you're providing value, not only in business, but in all your relationships, nobody's getting rid of you. As a matter of fact, they're going to keep ordering up and they're going to keep you around. So be someone who provides value. Be a solution-based salesperson. Be a solution-based company. And not just a, a bottom line, got to make a sales number company, because that's the road to just success, which often could just be mediocre, not really reaching your best self. And that's kind of how I think of everything in the what else. It's the what else, yeah, but it's also the, the level of non-acceptance is so critical. Like I can't emphasize it enough. And, and at that age, I wasn't willing to accept working every day after school. I wasn't willing to accept not having clothes and food, which is what started me to work to begin with. And sometimes the non-acceptance comes from a money grab. It's not always for the good of everything. Sometimes you just want a bigger house because you have kids and you want to have a family that, that has its own house. And I'm not going to accept this small little flat. Um, but, you know, ultimately, you, you want to have a combination of the money grab. And then you obviously the common good is critical. So, you know, doing things for the common good, doing things to help your company, to your teammates, uh, to your customers that sometimes doesn't always help yourself. But the common good, when you play that game, along with non-acceptance, oh boy, you're on the right track. You sort of have hinted at in some of your speeches and things because you're a renowned keynote speaker, is that you talk about the underdog mindset. What of the underdog mindset? Why is that mindset a good mindset and a good approach, do you think? Well, first, I'm hoping to come to Australia to do a keynote, just the only way I can talk my wife into making the big haul over there. So I'm hoping that's the goal of mine and somebody who hires me to bring me there. But let me, let's backtrack for a minute here. Sure. Why are we here? I mean, seriously. I mean, there are thousands of species on this planet. Thousands. Bugs, tigers, elephants, ants, dogs, cats. Not one of those species can get better. Not one, except for one species, the human species. You're never going to wake up. Go downstairs, your dog would have fed itself, walked itself, is reading the newspaper in the corner. You're never going to look at the fish tank and your, 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 your goldfish would be doing backflips, breaststrokes. We're the only species that can improve and get better. So if you're not doing something along the lines of understanding that we're here for a reason, which is to help others and to make this place better and for you to figure out how to improve, that's why we're here. That's the whole benefit of being a human being. 
in order to do that, in order to have the right mindset of non-acceptance back to that, but also you have to inquire, acquire an underdog mindset. Now, in your soul, you always want to have the favorite. In your soul, we are all deserving, good individuals uh, that are loving, caring. We all deserve to have those same needs met. But in your mindset, you always want to have a hostile mindset, an underdog mindset. Why? Why would you want to be the favorite? The, fa the underdog has nothing to lose. No one expects you to win. They don't think you could do it. They don't think you can go get to another level in your salary. They don't think you can get the corner office. They don't think you can go to the better college. They don't think you can make, be a starter on the team. And that's what's going on in your voice, in your head. And you're combining it with your soul, which says, if not you, then who? If not me, why not? Why not me? Why can't I do this? And you're having this kind of battle with these two voices. But ultimately, the mindset always needs to be the underdog because you have nothing to lose. And that's the inspiration of what I call the game within the game. If you get on the court and you're playing this, you know, you can't play the score. you got to always play the game. And there can never be a shot clock in your game. Your goal is to do your best, play your best, sell your best. And you're competing against yourself. And the only way to compete against yourself is to question whether you can actually go to another level and push yourself to that level. If you need somebody else to do it, that's when you incorporate the hostile environment. Now, I'm a happy guy. I'm just not a satisfied guy. But I have the hostile mindset along with my underdog, which says, I remember the guidance counselor that told me I couldn't go to college. I remember the girl that dumped me and said I was no good, rotten bum. I remember the kid that in... in uh, Hebrew school said to me that I was just a rotten street bum because I didn't have really nice clothes and I wasn't dressed appropriately and I couldn't afford them. I remember all the people that doubted me. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to prove wrong. Yeah. And I keep that mindset to make sure that I'm a little hostile because at the end of the day, the only time we've ever grown, if you think about it, is when we've been pushed, when we put pressure. I have like, employees that come to me, I'm really, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I'm really feeling a lot of pressure. I'm like, good, good. That's only the first and foremost time you can actually improve. Nobody ever got better saying, everything's great, feeling really good. Like, when did you improve and get better than that? When you, you know what I mean? Like, and the other thing is, you have to put immense pressure on yourself if you want to have immense results. Not all of them are going to be good, but you've got to push yourself. to that You have that kind of pressure on yourself, but also realize that life is difficult. And don't let that pressure be something that's going to overwhelm you. So... I'm sitting at a baseball game, and, and the most important thing is that you can't differentiate one day to the next. You can't say, well, this is a big meeting. This is a big podcast I'm doing with you. What does that say about all the other podcasts that I do? I give you the same attention in this conversation if I'm speaking to an audience of 10,000. I, I, I don't differentiate. And I think the problem is, is that most people... When they get into a big situation, they get themselves all amped up. But if they were in every situation, they're all amped up. You can never tell in my office if I'm making a five dollar sale or five million dollar sale. And I was at a ball game, and Mariano Rivera is a very well known pitcher, and he pitches the end of the game. He's known as a closer. And what's amazing is that he comes and sits down next to me in the middle of the game. I said, "Well, it's just a spring training exhibition game. What's the big deal?" He goes, "Big deal? Did you not just watch? I just pitched that last inning. One, two, three." knock them all out. I said, yeah, it's just exhibition. He goes, no. When I get on the mound and pitch an exhibition game, it's the same as if I pitch a World Series game, playoff game, bottom of the ninth, it doesn't matter. I never differentiate. This way, when something big comes up, I, I'm just doing what I normally do. And I think that's a mistake. People prejudge the situation, and then their level of commitment, their level of acceptance varies. To me, everything's a big deal. Everything is gets my all. Or, I sit home and take the day off. Mm -hmm. So if you're one of these people who say, well, I got a big meeting today. Huh? So the other meetings were meaningless? How many times have you gone on a meeting that you thought maybe wasn't that big a deal and then five years later ends up being a really big deal? You walk into a meeting and you see that same person now at a different company and all of a sudden, oh, yeah, we met five years ago. What impression are you leaving? Has to be a great one every time, whether it's with the mailman, whether it's somebody walking down the street. You want them to know you're a professional. You don't want to go get surgery. And the doctor says, well, this wasn't a big surgery for me. You don't want to be in a courtroom with, a, with your lawyer on a, on, a, on a life or death situation. Well, this is really not a big case for me. I've had bigger. 
And that's the difference between being an ultimate professional and being somebody who's on the road to extraordinary, which is really what, but my big thing about the what else is the road to extraordinary is pushing yourself and, and really making sure you, you know, consistency over time equals credibility. Everybody can have a good day. Everybody can have a good week, even sometimes a good year. But when you can do it over a long period of time, those are the people that you, people remember. And those are the people that you come back to. And those are, that's the business you want to get. I love when I get a call, Brandy, you know, I knew you 10 years ago. We did this thing. and I've been dying to quit. I got something for you. You remember me 10 years ago? I mean, how many people do you remember you met 10 years ago? Right? So imagine, you know, when, but when you get, as you get older, if you want to get to an extraordinary level, all those people, all the grains of sand is what equals the beach. Mm-hmm. So you got to take everybody seriously. You've got to have an underdog mindset. Your soul needs to always have the confidence that you are the best. You can be the best. You deserve to be the best. You deserve anything and everything that any other human being has. Not to ever short yourself. Never to play small. Your mindset says different. Oh, I don't know. That teacher said you were really, really just not that smart. You know, a couple of your friends thought you were a bunch of bumbling idiot. And you keep working those two voices in your head to do the best you can be. So it's interesting because a lot of people who have been successful. I'm fired up right now. Yeah, I can tell. (laughs) You're firing me up, but I'm just not showing the excitement as much as some of the people listening to my show may not actually be aware of who you are, being that I'm Australian based. So um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, your, your empire that you built. Um, before and the one that you're now rebuilding or building and talk about they're going to notice in the in the shots there some sports memorabilia so you're probably seen as uh, i'll use the word the king i don't know that's the word but um the king of sports memorabilia that you really put collectibles on the map and you are constantly asking what else in the sense of what else do people want what else could they want so do you want to talk a little bit about the story of steiner memorabilia well, I, you know i you know one thing has led to another and, and if you read the you gotta have balls book it really outlines everything yeah. but what i can tell you for sure is that one thing does lead to the other and the stuff that you don't think has is not a big deal always comes back around ends up being a big deal some of the players I met early on end up being a big deal, and some didn't be a big deal. But, you know, I ran and, and started Steiner in 1987, 32 years. And in, in the last year, I decided to leave Steiner and open up two new companies, the Steiner Agency, which markets players uh, and helps your businesses grow by, you know, hiring them as spokesmen and partners and get athletes to invest in your business. And then Collectible Exchange is like a new form of eBay because I feel like eBay is just not serving People that have collections, well, I mean, people want more authentication and more clarity about where the item's been. Uh, so we're trying to develop a site that's a little more of a place where collectors from all over the world, frankly, can buy and trade and get the story behind it so they don't feel like they're getting something fake. And I feel like um, I'll be partnered up with some really unique players and leagues, to, so you'll be able to buy stuff directly from them. So it's a very different platform than what I had at Steiner. It's hard to leave Steiner when your last name is Steiner, but I feel like I wanted to do something more. And it comes back to bite me on the what else, because a lot of people would have rode into the sunset with Steiner, being I was having a good run and look at all the things I've done. But I think when you start looking in the mirror and start patting yourself on the back, it's really time to go and and retire and and go golf somewhere because I just felt like I hadn't had my best day. And, and, you know, it's, you know, you have to keep a high level of humility in order to increase your ability. And for me, I've had a great run, mainly because I love serving customers. I love bringing, I love bringing fans closer to the game, doing all the things that I wish I could do as a kid, meet and greets with players. It's something I started 20 years ago, and now everybody does it, uh, really getting athletes to save their game used. Now everybody does it. But So I started so many different things, but I have the confidence that I'm going to start a whole bunch of new things. And I'm really looking forward to getting outside the country because I feel like there's a whole collectible world out there with soccer and cricket. And and, and I, I feel like there's some order to be put in those sports. And I'm looking forward to doing that. Now that my kids have been grown up, I could get on a plane and go to Europe and go to different parts of the world and help put collectible programs together. And because there's a lot of people here in the States that want Japanese baseball, that want cricket, that want soccer and vice versa. So that's kind of my goal. Like, you know, and at the end, I think 
the other thing is my purpose, which we talked about at the beginning, is really about taking the money I make now and really doing a lot of good charity stuff for kids, uh, for people that need help. Uh, every day I try to do two acts of kindness, and I think the common good, you shouldn't postpone your drive and interest in the common good because helping people is not a burden. Actually, it's an opportunity to, that will lead you to share joy. So you need to put that as part of your diet, even though it doesn't hit your bottom line. It's going to hit your heart and your soul and strengthen it. So I've been fortunate. I've done well, and I've done well in respect that I've been able to help a lot of people and uh, done, done a lot of charity work and helped a lot of other people do their charity work better, which I enjoy doing. So uh, that's my goal. And uh, it's a bit exciting, you know, to kind of reset. I don't want to hang it up. I think a mistake that people make, and I, I want to say this to your audience, is like, stop working really hard so that one day you don't have to work. That's a really bad mindset that a lot of people have. Like, I'm really working hard one day so I can retire. Like, I didn't work this hard for the last 30, 40 years so that I don't have to do what I do. I love what I'm doing. Why would I want to stop? And that's why people ask me all the time. like, why don't you just chill? Why don't you retire? Like, why? I don't, you know, you don't, you know, Tom Brady, you know, one of the greatest football players, or doesn't work that hard to be the greatest quarterback. So one day he doesn't have to play quarterback. So if you're thinking out there that you're working really hard one day so that you don't have to work, you're probably wasting a lot of your time and life is fragile and you're better than that. Mm hmm. So the journey, um, by the way, I will be putting links to the book uh, in books because you have multiple books in the description so that anyone who wants to see what you've written, which is covering your journey, you've written books throughout your journey and, um, and things that you've learned. So that's a legacy for, for those that are entrepreneurs coming behind you that you can learn from one of the most experienced entrepreneurs on the planet, if I can put it that way. Yeah. That's, you did a TED Talk. And that's how yep. I came to see and interact with you. And you've already touched on a little bit of the paper route story. So, which is where, which isn't actually where it all started because your f passion for work, well, not so much, well, it was passion or a drive, came out of a situation that occurred in the classroom, which gives an example of where the world perceived you at at a young age. You know what's crazy? Things? Like, every, everything's really boring. You know, like you think about the situation even now with this virus around the world, like, you know, when your back's against the wall and it's, it's, it's tough, I mean, it's, things are really rough. I mean, that's the exciting part. I mean, you may not be exuberant in the fact your back's against the wall, but, you know, when your back's against the wall is when really the motor starts really running. And I think everything else seems pretty boring. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my back's against the wall because I did to go get some money to, so I could eat when I was a kid. And I think... I think a lot of great things happen right after something bad happens or when you've been pushed, pushed, pushed past what you think your limit is. I mean, we're all, you know, back to back to the hostile, back to, you know, you you have the ability to get better and beat yesterday with the species. You know, we all have the ability to, to really deal with the pressure and push ourselves. You'd be surprised how much we can push ourselves much further than what we do. Uh, so, you know, for me, like one of the big, breaking points at, at, at the old company I used to run was my inventory manager came into the office and said, Brandon, we got a problem. What's the problem? Here? We have an overstock on uh, signed baseballs. I said, we got balls. So I put a billboard up on the highway and said, we got balls. And I put a picture of all the little baseballs on the billboard. And we started selling baseballs like crazy. Then he comes back two weeks later. I go, how's, how are we doing with the baseballs? Said, we're doing really well. But, you know, we have footballs and basketballs that we're overstocked on, too. So I said, we got big balls. So I put a second billboard and I put two ads in the paper. We got balls and we got big balls. People are loving that. It was catchy and everything. And it goes back to the what else. You know, I'm thinking like, well, what else? What else? And I started thinking about like people take where they put the balls pretty seriously. And we all think about, you now, where are you putting your balls? Like, you know, and at the time, I actually had one of these here. So like this is a cube. If you could see this here. And this was about, this cost me about 60 cents and I was selling these for five bucks. It's actually a Nolan Ryan baseball card. So anyway, I mean, most people would be happy you're paying 60 cents, charging five bucks. Who's better than me? But I was thinking, like, people are probably particular about where they put the balls, and they want to put it in a safer place. So what I did is I built a glass case. Oh, there's a Brandon Steiner baseball. Anyway, I built a glass case, ultraviolet rays, protected, cherry wood. Now you get this really nice place to put your balls. And most people would have been happy with now, again, I'm thinking, what else, what else? Instead, most people, when they come up 
with an idea, they're on, well, I, well, what's the next idea we can come up with? No, no, how about taking that idea and making it better? I always say your first idea is not your best idea. And when you're in a little bit of trouble and you feel a little stifled, go back to your best idea and make your best idea better. There's always room to take your best idea better. Everybody always wants to hire more people. Let's build another building. Let's get another floor in the building. No, no, how about taking what we do and making it better? So here I am. I got this glass case, 1999. Cost me a little under $5. Hey, I'm rocking. And by the way, the number one selling item at our company ends up two years later being cases. Not all the autograph stuff because everybody had all these balls and football and needed a place to put their balls. Now, one of the things I started thinking about is as I started looking at these cases that people couldn't read the signature on the ball. You got a soccer ball. You can't really read the signature. So what I did is I took these cases and I put a photo behind it. And I took some grass from the field that they were playing on, some dirt from the field, and I called it a photo dirt case. And I took the same case with a photo behind it and dirt on the bottom, and I charged $39.99. Added mm -hmm. $1 cost, but $6 cost, 39 But what the game changer was is I was serving and solving a problem for people. I was getting more emails from my customers thanking me for pretty much doubling the price, even though I tripled my profit margin. It didn't matter. The money, that's the thing. Everybody's so cost and profit driven. Be solution driven. When you solve a problem, price becomes a lot less important. Think about it. Somebody has to answer your problems. So here I am selling this same case for 39, only added a dollar between the grass and the photo. And customers are thanking me galore because now they can show off their balls mm -hmm. in a place and now people can read the signature on there. So, you know, remember that. Your first idea is not your best idea. And, and the road to success is about taking a really good idea and making it great and then making it greater. If you think about the greatest companies, they're not doing multiple things. Okay. Apple's not figuring out how they can improve the Walkman and trying to come up with all kinds of ideas. I mean, they got one or two products. That's it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you think about some of the great companies that, and what they, they're trying to do. Um, they really don't. They're not that wide. So it may be time, if you're thinking about growing your business, it may be time to actually narrowing your business and actually looking at what you're doing honestly and whacking some of those ideas that you thought were really good and then actually suck and getting your good ideas and really honing in with your group and your customers and getting feedback to take what's good and make it greater. Mm -hmm. and that's what I learned. You know, you got to have balls really pay dividends. I did. And that was your mom's. Was always elbowing, but meanwhile, you know, I end up, you know, coming up with this whole line of cases, which we sold millions of cases, and ends up being one of my more profitable items. It's amazing. And that was one of your mum's sayings too. So, <laughs> come back. In fact, I've noticed that a, a lot of the sayings that you've used, you, you your mum was obviously an inspiration. Well, I stole everything from my mother. You know, yesterday mm. was Mother's Day. I, I went to go see her, and I, and uh, at the cemetery, I just want to thank her. I said I can't quite give you the royalties. But I just made a ton of money because I was one of those kids that listened to his mom and uh, took all her advice and didn't do everything she said. But I took a lot of that advice and then I've been able to use those, some of the logic and some of the schemes and themes that she had. She was a businesswoman herself and I've made a lot, a lot of money. I just wanted to thank her. <laughs> mm. I just finished. Uh, yeah. I just finished watching or watching part of Gary V's thing and he actually talks about don't listen to someone's opinion, listen to their experience. So a lot of people are prepared to give you an opinion on what to do. So you just said you didn't always follow what your mother suggested, but I'm sure that, that she gave a lot of examples of what, you know, what she didn't have to give the opinion because you could see the work ethic and yeah. the things and the drive and the, the approach. Like she sat you down, you said, when you were doing your paper route and gave you a bit of a life story about business, which is, um, which is pretty cool. Like to think that you, your mother inspired you and, in, uh, in your journey along that way, you had a, a train ride that, uh, you had an epiphany. You wanted a, a, a better car and you didn't know how to, um, you know, put that to your wife that you need, you didn't want to do the train trip anymore when you were starting out. Do you want to explain um, yeah. what happened on the well, train? Well, first of all, one thing, one thing that's important, I always tell people, it doesn't matter what other people think, and, and nobody listens because everybody cares about what other people think. Everybody does. Everybody cares what other people think. And what I would tell you is, is that it's okay to think about what other people think, but not what 
everyone else thinks. Just care about what the people that matter to you the most, that you trust the most, think. Those people you need to actually take in consideration what they think. Everybody else, screw them. You know, the people on the outside from 10,000 feet above looking down, we don't care about what they think. But you know the people that actually you have their trust, they know you and see you, care about what they think. So I'm on the train one day, and while we're talking about my mom, uh, June 17th was the day that my mother passed. And on Mother's Day was the day we realized she was sick. She left us that quickly from Mother's Day to June 17th. And um, I'm on the train, and this guy's eating Chinese food. This other guy's got his shoes off, smelly feet. And this other guy right behind me is arguing with his wife. I'm sure they're on their way to divorce. And I'm like, I got to get off this train. And I got to a high level of non-acceptance about I'm, I'm, I'm getting off this train. If I do nothing else, I was a little down. I was not feeling too good about myself. I'm not really sure where the business was going. I, you know, I had all the trials and tribulations. And, and I said, I don't know where I'm going, but I'll tell you right now, I'm not going on this train anymore. i got to get off this train. I just start getting into a deep level of thinking. I look down, and I see this person who's got this uh, newspaper and a picture of Mark Messier and in New York, the Rangers, which is a hockey team, had it won in 54 years. And I see that they just won the Stanley Cup, which I'm a big Ranger fan. And the smile on his face, and this, the, whole, the whole back page of this newspaper was filled with Mark's grin. And I'm like, because my mind's going a million miles an hour of how I can get off this train. And I'm like, I bet I could sell 15,000 of those if I can get Mark Messier to sign them. And this is before, this is the mid-90s, 1994, where... You know, it wasn't a lot of autographs, definitely not hockey anyway. So it took me like two months to track Mark down. Lawyer, sister, brother, accountant. And I get Mark and I track him down. Why? Because I have a high level of non-acceptance. Why? Because I'm committed to doing anything and everything it takes to make a boatload of money. And sure enough, I get a deal with Mark and we sell a ton of those photos. And we do phenomenal. It's one of my, my first spokesperson, the first player I hired to start my company mm -hmm. and I still work with Mark to this day and the moral of that story is you know I got myself a nice Lexus SC400 at the time it's a great car and I wasn't taking the train and I wish I could tell you that I started my old company with this great uh, monumental spiritual want to do the good for man and wanted to get no I, it was a money grab I started my second company I had started marketing uh, the collectible company was a money grab. I just wanted to get off the goddamn train. And I, I would do anything and everything I could because I just had it. My level of non-acceptance was at an all-time high. And getting on a train was an all-time low. And I was going to do something about it. And I wasn't going to stop till it happened. And it been about 60 to 90 days of just chasing Mark down and doing anything I can to sign him up to a deal. So I had this vision of selling all this stuff that he would participate in. Exactly what I did. Now, after that, a lot of things took place and my mind started spinning into all these cool things that I could do for teams and players and most importantly, fans to get them excited and get them closer to the game. And, you know, the company took off and uh, the concept took off. And I didn't realize it was going to not only lead to a, a really cool company, but it was going to lead to a, an industry that had, had a real good pulse that people were appreciative of it. It's funny, like when I left my company, which was, you know, really, really tough day. I, can't, I got like thousands of emails of customers thanking me. I just don't remember ever writing an email thanking a, a, a CEO of a company for selling me a lot of stuff. <laughs> so, you know, I'm very it's, grateful to fans and, and, and to sports and, and all the people that have supported me over these years and now supporting me with my new company, Collectible Exchange. Like, you know, it's a blessing that when you know your work and your hard work and sweat and tears matters to people. You know, the, the stuff that I try to do to help people or some of the stuff that I've gotten athletes involved with to help charities actually meant something to people. It's very uh, humbling. Yeah, you've uh, something I've observed with every approach that you seem to have taken in business and something that some businesses get and some don't, and I think the majority actually don't, is win, win, win. And I think having an everybody wins strategy is actually a business approach that I wish more businesses would actually assume. But one of the ones or one of the interesting things that I want to bring up is your arrangement with the Yankees to actually purchase the old or parts of the old stadium. Are you able to speak to to that whole enterprise? Because that was a pretty big enterprise. I think when you have a great stadium like Yankee Stadium, and there are many around the world, 
I think knocking and tearing those down without respect is very uh, hurtful. What I love about the Yankees is, is they're one of the greatest brands in all of sports. And they had the confidence to be able to partner up with me and support me on the vision of what we want to do with it and not just blow it up and, and toss it away. And then, hence, you know, I created hundreds of thousands of pieces of that stadium from the grass. You know, we lifted the last field and freeze dried it. The bricks that were in the stadium, we sold these bricks. Um, you know, the speakers around the stadium, the dugout, the locker. And, and, you know, this was not an easy task. And it was a big commitment on the Yankees' part to help facilitate this. But when you're a real brand and you care about your fans, you care about the whole process you got to do these little things. It didn't help the Yankees on their bottom line. They're building a new stadium. they got a million things going on. But they always stay true. And this is what I love about And I, I want to ask your people that are watching, like, do you always stay true to your core values, which the Yankees is fans, fans, putting the best field, best players on the field? It's easy to say it. But when stuff like this comes up, can you do it? And that's what I love about the Yankees. Even the little stuff that they do, it's as important as the big stuff because when it involves their fans, they're as committed and serious about it. And that's why they have a great franchise. And that's why they're one of the best brands. People think it's just because they're in New York or this or that. It's, it's really not. It's a management style that they have that I love working with them. You know, 16 years, we had a great partnership and I'm still doing some stuff with them, but differently. So, and there was a lot of good learning lessons. I think you know, when you have an opportunity to work with the best, in this case, the Yankees, but some of the players I've got to work with, you have to take a step back and not only get excited, but to understand the responsibility and understand what comes with that. Because a lot of times people will, will go and get into these opportunities where you get a big account, a big name brand, or a big person you get to work with. And the thing about what they can get from them, I think about the value I can provide to them, and I also think what I can learn from them. And that's something I learned, you know, many, many years ago from my mom when I, when I opened up the first Hard Rock in New York. You know, most people, when you run into a big, big business that you get to partner with or you, you meet somebody really wealthy, you just think what you can get. And it's like, what can you give? Because that's the relationship. I mean, everybody thinks they can get something from somebody who has a lot. And then what can you learn? And for me, I, the learning lessons from the Yankees were just too many to count. Where most people would have been, oh, I'm with the Yankees, this, that. Yeah, it was exciting, but... I said, this, this brand is way, way over my head, way past my skis. And I got to figure out how, how, they, how they do this. How do they make such, how do they create such a meaningful brand year in and year out? And, you know, it starts with people, you know, great management, uh, which you know, always is, is so important when you talk about building your business, you know, whether you have one, two, whatever, you know, every person matters. And then, you know, thinking about your most important uh, asset, which is your customers. And a lot of companies forget that sometimes. Mm. Regardless with you, winning, losing, remember your customer, man, and, and try to over-deliver. It's interesting as you're speaking, I'm thinking, first I'm thinking of sport and how, because you're dealing in memorabilia and the words right there, memories, that sport actually, when we have an affinity with a sport, we're actually creating memories and they can be good or bad, but that's what your marketing is, the memory. So when Yankee Stadium is destroyed to make way for a new stadium what you're doing if you crush that that you're crushing a lot of people's memories if you're just blowing it up and destroying it so you can actually have people have a piece of of history and this is that everybody wins strategy because when you take that approach now we're not actually wasting anything we're actually even the planet wins so it's just an intriguing approach that that if, if people come together that they can actually achieve these things and that you you sold bricks you've also sold dirt which is even e equally as intriguing and uh, maybe that's a, a little bit of yeah, story you gotta watch the TED talk to see the i think so i dirt. think the dirt yeah, is an amazing story. story so i'll put a link to that you talk about you know walking away from the company on the last day of your Steiner memorabilia and you've now gone and ventured into some new enterprises you are really looking at this and still asking what else like what is missing like you talked about ebay and that they're not delivering for people who are in the collectibles and particularly sports collectibles market do you want to speak to the two companies i mean the first thing i think about is brandon are you crazy i mean it's hard you know i, I don't care what anybody says i mean it's hard to start something from new from scratch literally um but the, you know back against the wall 
hostility, high, non-acceptance, right? High with it. I mean, it's hard, man. You know, so you, you got to be up for that kind of challenge if you want to start something, regardless of whatever you've done. Believe me, you know, um, your past does not open up necessarily all the doors for the future. I mean, you got to still bang on doors. And, and by the way, just because you're a knock on a door doesn't mean that you can't push it open. You know, somehow, and, and 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 you know, I've learned that. You know, I've had to retool and go back to reading some of my early books, and you know, just some of the stuff that I've got to put into play because, you know, as you grow, you know, you lose sight on some of the important stuff, some of the little things you have to do just to get a business going. The Steiner agency is something that I've been doing for literally thirty-five years, and you know, marketing players is something I've always been able to do and do well, and we're still doing it. And, you know, really happy with that business. The collectible exchange, you know, we're disrupting the business. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to allow players to sell to consumers directly so they can control the market and they control what they want to do. And we're trying to add authentication uh, elements to things so people feel like they're buying stuff that's real. And that's the ultimate goal of the collectible exchange. I think when you start something, you know, you need to have an objective and a goal. And it needs to be somewhat lofty. And then you go through the, well, how am I going to do this? Well, when I started breaking that down, which, you know, it's just, you know, it's like, you know, you create a chart, like, you know, you got to, just to give you an idea, I mean, I'm just working on a basic principle, like, you come up with this damn goal and objective, and yeah, you want to make a lot of money, and you want to do something that's unique, and then you actually start coming into, a, what's the process here? Whoa. And you realize all the things you have to do, because most people, like, they say, well, friend, I want to have your success. No, you know, you want my process. You want to know how I did it. And I say, pop. You know, pop, you must progress on your process every day and you got to get engaged in your process. And it may be a while until you see those results where you start hitting those objectives and those purposes and the goals, which is what we all want to do. You know, we all want to see, you know, our, we want to see ourselves in first place, you know, which is the goals and objectives. But at the end of the day, it's really the process you really have to improve. And that's where people struggle. Like, yeah, you got to get healthier. You've got to have more energy to do more. How are you going to do more? You've got to have more energy to do more. You've got to be able to figure out how to be smarter. You've got to surround yourself with certain people that can help you do the things you, that you're doing slowly on the, on the manufacturing end of it, on the sales end of it. You know, so you're constantly looking at your processes. You've got this lofty goal, but the how to get to the goal, difficult. And I look at most people like, you know, I'll give you an example. It's kind of like a sprinter versus marathon runner. The problem is most people are in sprint mode. They get lined up, they're fired up, and then they sprint as fast as they can. And that's how they look at the race. But when you think about it, there's not a lot of strategy. There's not a lot of bigness to that, right? You, you, you know, you get go as fast as you can. You see where you end up in 40 or 50 yards. But when you play the marathon, there's all kinds of things that can happen over the course of a long haul. And there's a lot more strategy involved as far as your energy and sleep you got the weather, the conditions, all those things come into play. And that's how you have to look at business more in a marathon style. And I think too many people look at their, their uh, view on success as, as a sprint. I'm going to go, I'm going to go get a, this new customer. I'm going to go get this race. No, what you're really going to do is think about the process of how you get new customers. And you're going to improve that process of how to get new customers. Otherwise, you're just going to get this one customer. You're not going to know how you got it. And you're not going to be in a position to maybe go get another. So, you know, pop, you know, really must every day you want to beat yesterday, but you must progress on your process. You have to. If you're not improving your process, that gives you a better chance to win every day. The teams that have serious commitments to their process, when you hear the, the, your teams at the end of a game go, you know, we got to go back to practice, we got to get better. The teams that actually believe that, those are the teams that usually end up standing at the end and, and win the cup. But a lot of teams say it, but then when they go into practice, they go through the motions. And the teams that have the better practice players are the teams that end up being better, getting better, and doing really well over time. You refer to the concept, which you've sort of said there, but I'll sum it up as, in your words, that you got to focus on the game, not the score. So, um, and, and I think Simon Sinek t talks about infinite games and playing the long game and a lot of businesses don't really play the long game and he talks about the lot the businesses that tend to survive are the ones that are actually in competition with themselves so to get better yeah, you don't want to wake up and think about wanting to be somebody else i don't wake up and hope i'm going to be some other company 
because that's a road to mediocrity too. Like, you know, you can talk yourself into your dreams, you can talk yourself out of your dreams, but the most important thing, you don't want to try and emulate and be someone else in your life. It's a big mistake. Don't worry about what other people have. Worry about what you really want. Worry about what you need and really put that in perspective and prove the process in getting it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen overnight. It, it doesn't have to. But at the end of the day, what really makes people happy is progress. You know, when you're making progress, when things are improving, when you see things getting better, you're getting better. That's what makes people happy. Not making a big sale or uh, having one day that was that, when you think about happiness, I mean, people get a little confused. I mean, it, you know, happiness is like an overplayed word. I mean, who's, are you happy? Hmm. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm in a happy mode because we're making progress. And I may have some sad moments with the setbacks and everything. But generally, if you're making progress and you understand the methodology that you're using, the strategy you're using, and you believe in it, you're confident in it, and you're confident in yourself, you're probably happy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Your latest book that people can attain is living on purpose. On purpose, yeah. Now, in- Love that book, by the way. I, I actually started reading it again last night. My wife's like, you're reading your book again? I see, it's a really good book. She's like, you're crazy. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's, it, it is one of those books that's, you could pick that book up and read like one chapter. You could pick it up anywhere in the book and read one chapter and be good. Mm-hmm. It's, got, it's just chock full of nuggets that are just, really really good that i've got from a lot of really smart people mm. uh it, it's because i talk to people about passion all the time and i actually get people obviously that's what i'm doing but i get people who actually have said to me you know audience and things like that saying um i don't have a passion and i say if you can't find your passion find your purpose because in finding something that is almost a cause or something that motivates you to be driven you often just fall into your passion so i i would probably you obviously always love sport but when you started out you were linking sporting people with organizations uh, with your steiner agency this memorabilia stuff was almost an epiphany on a train secondary. that's it yeah, it was secondary and, and it's become the bigger and often people fall into their their passion and um, obviously you are passionate about it you've got to meet a lot of people you're talking earlier about too you know giving those individuals the one experience like if you're in an audience and jordan talks about that a lot like he went out and did his best every game for that one individual that would only ever see him play that once that may have paid for a good ticket or a bad ticket but may, may never have seen him play again so his approach was to that. yeah was to give that that standard so i noted on your actual i've got a question that's a lead in that's a segue i noticed on your actual um website steiner uh brandonsteiner.com that you actually have a photo with michael jordan so is there a story with him or or is that just in yeah i mean michael was amazing i went to his i went to his fantasy camp in 2000 and uh i got hurt the second day and you know i was really bummed and, and he had stepped on my foot on the way coming over i thought he was going to say brandy you okay and he steps on my foot and goes on the court to play with my team and i'm just devastated this is 20 years ago and i go home and i start getting into rocky mode and, and for some reason i just started playing the game within the game like i'm going to go back to the camp and I'm going to kick Michael Jordan's ass. I'm like, and I'm telling him all my friends this. And they're like, Brandon, calm down. It's not. And I'm shooting and I'm running. I'm lifting weights. And, you know, I thought I was in good shape. That's the other thing. I, you know, a lot of times you don't tell yourself the truth. You're just dead wrong. That's why it's important to keep some people around you that will tell you the truth. I call those the accountability police. And I wish somebody had told me that I wasn't in as good a shape as I thought I was in. But this next year, I got myself in much better shape. And, so I saw Michael and I told him that I want to get on the court with him and kick his ass. And uh, I had a dream because I always think everything starts with the dream. And I had the dream that I kicked his ass and it was just a really good day for me. He said, that sounds more like a nightmare. <laughs> it was funny, man. So we get, you know, we're out and he, he's like, you know, we pick up, you know, we play basketball at seven in the morning, man. Tomorrow morning. I said, I'll be there. Let's go. And don't bring that North Carolina stuff, that powder blue stuff. It's not going to scare me. But we get on the court. And we're playing four on four. First of all, on the first play, I boxed Michael out. I grabbed things that another man should not be grabbing. We were like 10 feet off the court. And he's like, who are you? And I was just trash talking. Like, Michael, it's not going to work out for you today. But on a serious note, before I really get into the heart of the story, I just want you to know when I got on the court with him, 
I know it's just delirious, but I really thought, you know, this guy's not that big. I think I got him. I think I could check him. I think I could actually handle him. Um, this this guy, I, I think I got it. And I know it's delirious, but I just want you to understand every bone in my body was confident. Um, but in my mindset, I say, nobody here thinks that I'm going to be able to do what I, what I think I'm going to be able to do in this game. But I was confident and I, I was prepared. I was confident in my ability. And I like my strategy. My strategy is get the ball and shoot. So the first time I get the ball, which is over on the left side on the wing, I shoot it. And Michael wasn't taking me that seriously, and it goes in. And he kind of gives me the palms. Like I said, Michael, why don't you play a little defense? Obviously, you're getting a little old. Maybe you can't guard me. And I, I was going crazy on the trash talking. But so the next time I get the ball, I go and shoot. And he's kind of a little good distance away from me. And he, I mean, he was like Superman. Boom. I mean, I don't know where this man came from. I don't know what happened. I mean, I don't know if the ball was landed 20 years later. It's like, and I was, it was a little bit of a, you know, punch in the face. I was like, whoa, I guess maybe this party may not be quite as extensive as I was hoping it would be. But anyway, we're playing, and it's six to five in the seven game, and he's got the ball, and he's kind of, you know, yeah. and I'm thinking that maybe this little soiree is over. But I'm still guarding him, and I'm checking him, and I'm, I have a moment of a little doubt, and I'm thinking, Maybe this is over. And he passes the ball to the short, stumpy guy underneath. And he misses the layup. I run to the right elbow. And I clap. I get the ball. Shoot it. Nothing but net. It's high score. Now, I know I, I take the ball out. I want to pass it to the worst guy on the court. Why? Because he's nervous. Game on the line. He's going to pass it right back. And he does. So I pass it to the guy in the corner. Now I'm on the right elbow, but five feet behind it, more on the top of the key. And I see Michael coming. Problem is, one of his guys gets in the way, and he can't get to me. I square up, shoot the ball. At that point, a good amount of the camp had filed in. I square up, boom, it goes in, game over. And I say, Michael, get off my court now. You're a loser, okay? I beat you. I mean, I don't know what, I went crazy. I see. And maybe you could have next and play me in after you sit on the sideline and wait, he's like pissed. <laughs> he sits down next to my friend. Thank God I have my friend with me to watch the whole thing. And he goes, who is Steiner? <laughs> What's funny about that story is, and I want to, hey, listen, it's a, it, it's a funny, entertaining story. And it's true. And, and I talk about it in the first book. But first of all, it's so important to dream. I mean, it is the initiator of everything great that happened. And picturalization is something that I use a lot with big accounts. When I went in to get the Yankees to sign with me, like I use picturalization in an incredible way because you can control your thoughts. And if you put incredibly good thoughts and positive thoughts and schemes to, to get something to work out, you'd be surprised the power you have to get something done. And I'm sure if I played Michael Jordan a hundred times, there's a good chance I could lose a hundred. There's more than likely, but at the end it didn't happen. I had that dream. I had that vision and it happened. It happened. And every time I see Michael, by the way, at a golf tournament, whatever, he immediately beelines over to whoever I'm with and says that I'm a complete liar, <laughs> that none of this happened, and I should, that they should be listening to me. Yeah. They got him. I mean, you know, that's just the greatest of all time, man. And I, I got him. I mean, I got him on a bad day. You know, I, I, had, to, you know, I, had, my, I had my say. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a great player. I'm not this, that. But on that particular day, you know, I have my day. Every dog has his day. You've been talking about underdog mindset and you've been talking about um, other mindsets. It sounds like it was a combination of everything that you more or less believed that you weren't, that you knew you were the underdog, but you said, no, nah, that's not going to work. 20 but... years later, you know, I'm still happy. <laughs> like, I don't need to even, I, I, I'm just still happy that that moment happens. I love basketball and I still play. And I know that that probably that situation will never happen again, frankly, but it happened. I still love telling the story. And my wife's like, I cannot hear the story again. I'm like, I need this on my tombstone when I die. I want just a small version of what happened. Here. I want people that after they walk by, I want them to know what I did to that guy. You said it might never. Anybody can have that day if you concentrate, make a commitment and dream big. And I want the people that are listening to know that you, your dreams are powerful. And the commitment you put towards your dreams is powerful. And you'd be surprised what you could talk yourself into. Yeah.
that's that's, a, that's a great story. That's a great story. I actually didn't expect that story, so that's that's gold. No, a lot of fun there, obviously, and you you've had a number yeah. of athletes, you know, over the years, and a lot of them are highly competitive, and I I think you know being in that environment, you talk about positivity, you talk about a lot of the things that that have driven you today, including you know positivity, and I think one of your your things that you talk about in keynotes is finding good positive people around to have around you that that breeds positivity absolutely what sort of failures have you actually had over the years that have driven you to success because it can't all be good so many i mean especially when you're running something you know you're going to fail and and you're going to struggle i just think the most important thing is failing is not the opposite of success it's a big part of success and life is hard Life is difficult. Life is full of a bunch of bad shit that can happen. And the faster you recognize that when you run into bad stuff and and things do get difficult, you'll be in a much better position to absorb it and deal with it. It never gets easy to fail and lose. But on the other hand, if you're prepared for it to some degree, when when you go through, you know what you need to get out of it. And obviously, you know, you always want to learn and, you know, and get lessons learned from failure. Um, I talk a lot about the failures, which is really worthwhile. The the, nothing about the third book, Living on Purpose. I was probably the most transparent about all my failures in that book because I I wanted people to understand that, you know, you got to take a step back and look at those failures. Mm -hmm. So uh, I I won't hold you up anymore. I do really appreciate your time. Thanks for having Uh, me. I I do answer all my questions on LinkedIn. Unfortunately, you got to follow me on LinkedIn because I'm past the connection mode, but mm -hmm. I answer all my messages on LinkedIn and, um, you can go to brandsteiner.com and register for the blog, or you can just Facebook, you know, go on Facebook and like my Facebook. Yeah, and you also have your podcast too, Project X, um, and yeah. you've you've had um, other been on other pro- podcasts, including mine now. So um, hopefully, I'll get a share on your uh, your social. Yeah, I love stuff. these conversations; they're great, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting to Australia at some point. Uh, and, uh, uh, Visiting, I heard it's amazing. So I'm hoping it's one of my one of my list of things to do. Appreciate you being on the show. Well, Is good it- luck. I, I, you got a good thing going, and just keep keep you know keep keep responding, and make sure you know it's your return on interaction. You know, keep the interaction going, and you'll be fine. Excellent. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. I hope you liked this episode. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and feel free to comment. If you haven't yet subscribed, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to be advised of new interviews when they're uploaded. I hope you join us again sometime. Catch you later.